I'm on a mission to bring clarity to the chaos. The housing market has so many crazy things happening right now. And we're going to use this episode of Powerhouse to bring you some clarity and also tell a really cool story about a really interesting executive in the housing market. Today's guest is Mike Tassone, the COO and co-founder at Own Up. Mike's career has taken him from being an entrepreneur to a mortgage banker, back to entrepreneurship and executive leadership at Own Up. And in today's conversation, we talk about that journey, but we tie it back to the very recent Fed announcement from Jerome Powell. We tie it to margins and interest rates and inventory and lead gen and all the things that are driving this market forward. We even talk a little bit about the NAR settlement, what that means for loan originators and lead gen and how it may change the nature of their relationship and lead gen with real estate agents. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Mike Tassone, COO and co-founder at Own Up. Mike, welcome to Powerhouse. Clayton, good to be here. Thanks for having me. I don't know how we scheduled a podcast to record right in the middle of Jerome Powell's Fed message. I was uh, I was late for the show coming over from that, uh, watching it on CNBC. Yeah, I figured I'd get bumped on such a, uh, a noteworthy day, but appreciate it. Fortunately, I'm not the journalist covering this. I know Logan and James in our newsroom are running fast on, on content right now, but uh, I guess overall, first glimpse kind of an uneventful Fed meeting. Yeah, I'd say so. No, no real surprises from our end, sort of everything had been priced in in terms of no movement. Um, you know, it's sort of this pesky inflation number that, you know, just quite can't get down to the target that they've sort of established. And, you know, I think if there's a positive in the message, it's still three expected rate cuts. And, you know, the market seems to, at least the equity market seems to have responded you know, somewhat favorably to that. The um, bond market's been pretty muted. So, yeah, that's what I was saying too. Pretty pretty muted market. It kind of got what we expected. Uh, no surprises to the positive. The the um, the press release revision looked like they made one small edit, which was slightly more pessimistic. We're still seeing economic growth. Um, we're still seeing a very tight job and labor market. So I think those are those are things that the Fed's just not going to take their eye off of. And um, and I get biggest fear is that we come to the next meeting and like we still don't have any um, guidance on when those three rate cuts will actually come. Yeah, my quick take is um, they were kind of late to act as inflation got out of hand and they don't want to get a little uh, too far ahead this time going the other way and sort of being overly dovish. So, you know, when you have jobs numbers that come out like the ones we've had and you've had, um, you know, otherwise stubborn inflation, it's hard to just go ahead and start cutting away and um, there'll be time, but I think it was sort of prudent given uh, given what's happened. I've never been a maniacal Fed watcher. I think it like, you know, can create a lot of short term thinking. A reason I am paying more attention right now is because we've been in this environment where economists and analysts across the industry and capital markets just keep kind of put kicking the can down the road on expected impact for, for mortgage rates. And, um, you know, the the five and six handles that a lot of economists and market analysts thought we'd see in the second half of 2023 became first half of 2024 became second half of 2024 and um uh that it's it's hard not to become a fed watcher when you're waiting for a little more certainty over when forecasts might actually become reality instead of just a can that keeps getting kicked with a big texas sized leather boot yeah, I've I've probably gone the opposite way. I used to um, be more of a maniacal follower, and then you know one of the things that I think is hard is to kind of stop focusing on things you have limited control over. And if you listen to you know pundits all day on CNBC and Bloomberg, you can drive yourself crazy. And ultimately, um, you know, I think we're here for somewhat higher mortgage rates for longer, and the market needs to adapt. And I think there's you know still too much supply. Um, and too few houses. So when you have that dynamic, it just leads to you know a really frosty market that's going to take some time to uh, to fall out here. All right. So Mike, you are a former mortgage banker turned founder. Today you operate as the COO and co-founder at Own Up. Give us a little context to your background. What was your what brought you into mortgage banking, and and how has that story led to the venture that you you now lead today? 
Yeah. So um, my background was always been in kind of consumer finance. I was involved in a startup out of business school that did student lending primarily. What uh, was that startup called? Uh, it was called GL Advisor and had a, okay. had a good run. Um, you were help, helping folks with refinance uh, student loans. Um, that business effectively- so was that around the same time that like SoFi was going into that that refi market? Like what did that marketplace look like when you were like, in that venture? Yeah, we were on the tail end. We were primarily focused on federal student loans and SoFi came in and was focused on more of the private um, lending. And then the federal market effectively got taken over by the government and sort of the business we had built um, just wasn't viable and tried a couple of pivots, yeah. just wasn't- uh, you know, what wasn't working. Um, so I went and worked at a, a bank outside of Boston, started by you know, a great entrepreneur in mid 2000s, I think, um, but really had a mortgage company mentality. Like the, the bank's early growth was really founded on um, how do we build a, a mortgage bank? And it was a lot of fee income. And uh, we, we built a, a really, uh, I would say, pretty impressive platform, grew it to the top bank lender in the state of Massachusetts, top 40 lender in the country. Uh, and that's where I met my current co-founder, um, who had been there a couple years prior to uh, me, me joining. And, you know, I think we always wanted to f do something more entrepreneurial and something around the mortgage shopping experience, because yeah. in the tens of thousands of transactions we were involved with, you know, through our, our mortgage banking experience, nothing was more frustrating than watch a, watching a consumer struggle to shop for, for financing. Um, not only because of the uh, the tremendous amount of lenders out there, but the different loan programs. And, you know, if you think about the mortgage transaction, really the real estate transaction, you know, it's a high consideration, low frequency transaction. And whenever you have those type of dynamics, I think it can lead to sub-optimization. And, and this is like the largest financial transaction that most people undertake. So when you make a mistake and, you know, you, you potentially don't shop or you take the first offer or you take, you know, a specific recommendation without, you know, looking at what else is out there, the cost of that suboptimization ends up, you know, being really large, and that was sort of the problem we were uh, thinking about trying to solve. Um, and then I think secondarily, you know, in our, in our view, everything in mortgage—not everything, but there's a lot of stuff that was just not particularly consumer centric. You know, we got to fill out this 20-page form before you can get rates, and I got to do a hard credit check, and I need your social security number. We'd hear that feedback on the lending side all the time. We said, okay, well, if we could redesign a consumer experience from scratch. How would we do it? Well, we'd try to create as little friction as possible, use technology to do a lot of the automation and sort of the qualification of consumers. Um, I think the important thing, though, was we don't think mortgage um, or real estate, for that matter, is something that's ready to be done with, without a human. You know, like the actual elements of getting a mortgage or you know seeing a home today is still something that requires humans, and that's led to the creation of what we call our sort of concierge service. Uh, I'm happy to go more into that, but th that's a, a opportunity for consumers that want to engage with somebody who doesn't have a you know horse in the race to help them figure out their options. An option for them to succeed and you know not sub optimize on that. So going back to that experience at Leader Bank and the and the growth that you had in Massachusetts and getting up to to national top forty rankings on on Honda stats, like give us a glimpse into the strategy that you were executing and helping execute at that time at Leader Bank? What, what, what drove growth in that time period? Yeah, I would say um, two, twofold. One was we hired some really good loan rich handers. Your okay. retail LOs who were you know, high quality, had great relationships, and just did a good job. You know, like put good files in, you know, eased sort of the underwriting burden on our operations staff, and ultimately they're doing uh, well by their consumer. What what was the recruit? Let's go like okay, hire great originators. That that's awesome. Like we all want to do that. But like, what was the recruiting strategy? The tactic? The differentiators? What like attracted and retained those people that were like ended up being secret sauce? Yeah, I'd say a combination of um, rates, access to portfolio products, yeah. and you know, if you look at the stats, there was a recent one I looked at. It's something like seventy eighty percent of the revenue and your average. Um, you know, mortgage or in it, originator is generated by the top 20, 30 producers, right? So if you end up focusing on a lot of bottom producers thinking, hey, I'm just going to get all these units in the door and uh, I don't have to pay, you know, uh, base salary. So uh, more more volume is better. We, we never subscribe to that. You know, the type of volume that comes in, the um, type of originators you target is, is super important because I think lenders tend not to measure some of the indirect costs Hey, if I got to work, you know, ten files to get five through, that's a really inefficient use of of resources. So, 
we would track everything from, you know, uh, pull through by originator and concessions and exceptions and all the things that, um, yeah, I think we've taken to our, uh, company here, just like a, a, a real reliance on data and using that to inform, uh, decisions. So, uh, yeah, you start with good originators, you give them a good platform, um, you combine that with good rates and you, you, you end up with a, a formula that works. What, what years was, was this period we're talking about at, at leader bank? I'm kind of well, I'm curious about the, you know, the, the market dynamics, you know, everyone's all, someone's always out there telling a story about like the strengths of depository versus mortgage bank versus wholesale. I'm kind of curious the dynamic, the period you were operating in and the market dynamics that may have made being a bank lender or depository a, a, an advantageous spot. Yeah. So this covered, I'd say 2010 through 2015, um, give or take. And, you know, we saw a few different cycles there. I think the thing we've always uh, focused on both at Leader and now at OwnUp is the, the purchase consumer. And, um, you know, I, in, for, as far as being a depository, I think the advantages there, you know, sort of cost to capital. But ultimately, we, like many other banks, end up selling the vast majority of the production to aggregators or, um, uh, you know, or the agencies. So I, I think that was, you know, the long, that, that part of the business really operated more like a mortgage bank and we reserved the portfolio for stuff that there just wasn't good execution in the secondary market for. And so it's become an increasingly popular model, right? Like the, the mortgage bank inside of a depository or even a, a, a mortgage bank acquiring a depository. We've seen a few times in recent years to kind of gain that advantage of portfolio of a proprietary product, but also still like the ease, efficiency, capital efficiency of like selling to an aggregator or doing agency business. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I think the other thing, the other benefit you get within a depository is mortgage is inherently cyclical and yeah. having other lines of business gives you sort of a, a natural hedge in times where, you know, mortgage just may not be, um, may not be performing versus a monoline independent mortgage bank. If they're not making loans, um, they just don't have a, you know, don't have a viable business. So in your lending days, what were your strengths as an executive? Like what, where did you kind of separate yourself and like, how did that define who you've become as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think, um, I sort of focused my efforts on, uh, secondary market, you know, finance, that's sort of my, um, my background historically. So I sort of gravitated, I think towards that area, but I also covered sort of our inside you know, sales group and a portion of the operations team. So I think, you know, that, that sort of provided a pretty good foundation because you think about the early days of starting a company, you know, it was three of us in a room. We, we didn't, uh, we didn't have anybody that was a specialist in this. So we were all, you know, trying to like, who's sort of the best at this one thing we got to do. And let's put that person on it and, you know, do it manually until, you know, it, it doesn't scale anymore. And then you sort of figure out, yeah, some technology to, to improve upon that. So, I don't think any, you know, one thing, um, but it was the variety and the ability to, I think, have exposure to a number of different areas and, you know, be a B plus player in a number of different things that ultimately serves, um, you know, being an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, especially in the early, you know, days where you just don't have the, the luxury of resources and, you know, advanced skill sets in like a bunch of different disciplines. I, I would expect, I mean, with the, uh, the stereotype of the, the, the confidence from, um, the, the Massachusetts, uh, persona i'm surprised you call yourself b plus i would have uh i would expect a a, a plus yeah. all the way that i'm thinking you're getting like some some southern um uh characteristics here with the underselling your skill set well yeah if my mom listens I, I wouldn't want to be accused of being uh you know being uh uh haughty or anything but uh no so yeah yeah i, I think um it, it's it's really that those early days are it, it, you have to sort of i think solve for broadness of skills versus specialization. And then yeah. you know, when you have product market fit and you're looking to scale, that's when you really need to specialize and sort of hire the people that are better than you. And if I look at our, our team, you know, almost everybody's better than the founders at some specific or many specific things. So you, um, we started the conversation talking about the today's fed, um, presser and the words coming out of Jerome Powell's mouth. And like kind of tying that to some of your exposure and expertise in, in capital markets as a B plus player, at least, um, how do you think about, uh, like kind of the, the, the pricing ecosystem we're navigating right now where spreads are, you know, higher than any of us are comfortable with, but it seems to be some market dynamics driving that, like give us a glimpse into how you're kind of perceiving how capital markets are behaving. Candidly, an area that 
I spend less time on now, but the, the one thing we do yeah. track pretty closely is, you know, what's sort of the 30 year mortgage spread to the 10 year treasury. That's always sort of been the benchmark. Yeah. And I remember back in the banking days, you could set your watch to 170 basis points added to the 10 year would give you effectively your conforming 30 year, um, 30 year fixed rate. Those spreads have gapped out. I think we're at like 260, 270 basis points. And so, you know, there's room with some level of normalization between that for mortgage rates to drop maybe an eighth, eighth or a quarter without any, you know, that's a pronounced Fed, um, Fed activity. But to my early, earlier point, sort of focusing on the things you have control over, I seldomly look at rates on a daily basis. I mean, maybe once a week, I'll sort of see where things are because it's just something that we, we don't have um, r- really any control over. So we're trying to play the hand we're, we're dealt here, as I know a number of others in the industry are, and trying to figure out, okay, where do I fit in the sort of new norm of tight supply, high rates, affordability issues, um, glut of supply, and, you know, just no uh, refinance transactions. And, you know, I, I, I fear the ones that are just sort of waiting for the next refi push. It, it's I forget the exact number. I think the last mortgage bankers report, the average loss per loan was like a thousand plus, maybe it was 1100 bucks. Sitting and waiting for refis when you're losing 1100 bucks per loan is just not an effective strategy. Um, so, you know, I think those that have operated quickly, like we've gone through downsizing, I think like much of the industry has, but we position our business to succeed, I think now in pretty much all, you know, rate environments. And sometimes sort of the hard truths of, hey, we're in a, a really um, cyclical downturn here. And even when the economy was humming, you talk to an average mortgage loan officer or a realtor and they say like, this actually feels like a recession to us, which, you know, it is. The market shrunk 60 plus percent the last uh, last year or so. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, in, in that case, you got to do the sort of hard things and, you know, cut your costs and figure out where, w- what's your sort of special sauce and where you fit into the ecosystem and then just, you know, drive your strategy towards that. I think the risk of waiting is prevalent, uh, like across housing. It's not just the mortgage lenders who are still sitting on a bloated cost structure. Like I remember like, you know, going back to 20 to 22, the first few people that like pulled the lever on reducing expense profiles, they looked weak, but six months later, 12 months later, it started to look really smart. And they were the players that can actually, you know, play offense as this stage of the market cycle prolongs a little longer than most of us are comfortable with. But the risk of waiting is also incredibly high on on the consumer side. It's one of the things that like scares me the most about housing is the number of people who say that they are waiting until home prices come down, home price appreciation flattens or goes negative, um, interest rates are down. Like I just don't believe that like the cost of home ownership from like a monthly payment perspective is is going to cooperate the way a lot of sidelined consumers think it is. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on there. A um, couple of things I'd point to, you know, let's say rates were in the fives. You get some unlock. There'd be some people that sort of are eligible for a refinance that are at seven or eight and now can sort of benefit from a meaningful monthly payment savings. You got some people that were sort of waiting on either upsizing or downsizing. It's just how, you know, more palatable. But ultimately, we still have a housing shortage. And, you know, most of the markets we follow, there's still scarcity scarcity of, of inventory. So if you basically don't do anything on the inventory side, and inventories are up, I think, like 15% in most markets year over year. But if you don't do anything on the inventory side and you just solve the affordability side, you now have potentially more money chasing the same amount of homes. So that doesn't do anything to adjust, you know, sort of prices. So there, there was an article in the journal today just on sort of the Austin housing market, not too far from from when you're at, uh, where you're at, and was saying, you know, this is the worst performing housing market and it's down 10% since I think the peak in 2022. But the sentence before that said, hey, by the way, it was also up 60% from the beginning yeah. of COVID to COVID. So-, so let's look at that metric over like three, four, five years. And, um, but yeah. So, I mean, your, your home market in Massachusetts, I mean, so you talk about most housing markets being up 15 to 20%. Um, at Housing Wire, we believe we could actually end the year up at a national level of inventory up 40%, which would be really good for, um, really good for bringing some, I don't know, like lubrication to the industry, more, more inventory to bring people off the sidelines. Um, and we also know that the most common home buyer is a home seller. So it's just it's transaction volume. But Massachusetts market remains incredibly tight. Like one of the markets that's actually not 
um, adding inventory. So like in a, an environment where if we saw rates of the five handle or low sixes, like what happens in Massachusetts? Like doesn't home prices, don't home prices just shoot through the roof and like that consumer gets left behind even more? Yeah, Massachusetts is an interesting one um, because it's also constrained with limited opportunities for new development. So using your your state as an example, you still have swaths of open land you can build on. You know, there's only so many skyscrapers you can put in Boston, the metro area. Um, so yeah, I think it's a real, um, it's a real issue. Now the, the strengths of Massachusetts, I think are sort of a really diverse economy that attracts a lot of people, right? We've got education, we've got finance, we've got, um, technology, we've got sciences. So while the income, um, the, the increase in wages haven't kept up with sort of the home price appreciation, it, it's likely they've kept up better than some other markets where prices went off, uh, uh, through the roof and then the wages just haven't, um, you know, haven't sort of followed suit, which, you know, can, can I think, you know, Matt Masters has some level of insulation, um, but your, your point's fair. This is not, this, this is not an s- easy solution without adding, you know, millions of units of housing. Okay. So we're gonna talk about own up. So you and your co-founder started the business. I think you said you started in working on the project in 2015, came to market in, in 2016. Um, give us a glimpse into the, the problem that was being solved then. And we've also, eight years later, gone through a few different like market dynamics. We saw, we've seen margin environments um, change in IMBs. We've seen lead environments change. So initial founding story and let's evolve to where we are. Cool. Yeah. So initial founding story, um, co-founder and I were looking to do something entrepreneurial. We weren't that smart, but we knew a bit about mortgage. And I think we had to sort of experience firsthand the frustrations, not only that customers of ours um, that were looking for mortgages went through, but also our own story, you know, like. We didn't use our own bank to get our mortgage. Why was that? Well, we were able to sort of shop because we had connections and we had industry know-how and we had tools um, and, and do a better job than certainly the average person could have done in, in terms of securing our own you know, personal home financing. And so we said, look, if we could create a better, more frictionless shopping experience where consumers can you know, shop amongst a network of lenders, um, that'd be pretty good. You know, I think at the time when we were getting started, the CFPB had come out with a study that said, you know, more than 50% of homeowners took basically the first mortgage offer they had, but then rates varied by as much as half percent for the exact same scenario. So those people that just basically said, Hey, I'm going to take this first offer had a very high likelihood of getting, you know, not the best deal they could secure. Um, so that was sort of the demand side of the market we were trying to solve for, give consumers, I think, more empowerment and enable them to shop uh, more efficiently. Um, the other dynamic, and this is really important is the, the lender side of it. So we never wanted to be a lender. We've done that. You know, there's obviously, um, great benefits to being a lender, but there's also sort of a lot of costs and other issues that you got to deal with. Um, and we said, we don't think that's our special sauce. We think our special sauce is, you know, finding high quality, high intent consumers, helping them qualify, helping them figure out, you know, the best lender or lenders for their scenario, and then matching them to the right lender. So Early on, our lender network was you know, small community banks, credit unions, um, small independent mortgage companies in our local market of Massachusetts that had an appetite to get into what I would call, and I think the industry referred to as more traditional direct consumer um, advertising. But they didn't like the idea that they would go and spend a bunch of money on a lead generation platform with you know a high degree of uncertainty around what that return would be. In fact, if you were to call up um, XYZ lead generator and ask, Hey, what if I spend, you know, 50 K on your platform, you know, what conversion rate can I expect? And they're going to give you a very wide range, um, that, you know, is, is sort of as they should, yeah, cause it's like, there's a wide degree of talent out there in the operating models of how well people execute on leads they're delivered. hundred percent. Yeah. And so for, for that group of lenders who either were maybe a, gu- a little gun shy about, um, trying sort of more direct consumer model. Part, partnering with OwnUp offered an opportunity where they didn't have to do a whole lot. You know, we would do the vetting yeah. of the consumer. We would make sure that the intent was there, and then we connect them to the, the lender that you know was sort of in their market and interested in their business. Um, I think the unlock, at least on the consumer side, was you know we, we knew we needed to offer them shopping, and we needed to have better rates than they could likely secure on their own. And the way to ensure that is to adjust us uh, our, our compensation. To make sure that lenders were in a position to not squeeze their margins, but offer better rates than you know they could elsewhere. In fact, we had 
lenders are offering better rates through our channel than they would, you know, if you call the lender directly. So counterintuitive for, for the at, um, average consumer, but something that's very prevalent in mortgage. You have different channels, you have different margins, um, and ultimately different different rates. So when we first launched, I think we probably had three lenders on the platform, and you know, we would always benchmark our rate data. We have access to all the pricing engines. We get you know daily rate feeds for more than sixteen thousand lenders we could tell you exactly where you sit relative to everybody else, expose that data to you and really give you confidence that you're making a decision that's ultimately sort of the best one given um, given your circumstances. So I would term that as like own up 1.0, like the um, home advisors, the concierge was me and Patrick and, you know, a few other folks that, uh, you know, wanted to subject ourselves to 20 plus, you know, calls a day. Um, Poor technology, a lot of stuff done in spreadsheets, but yeah, you know, that's sort of the the, the classic um, you know beginning of, of any story. Up. Okay, so before we go to two point oh, I'm talking about more about one point oh. So um, I think that there's like a kind of a dichotomy between um, it's probably right, and if you're advising any like family member or friend on getting a mortgage, that they should shop around to get get the best outcome. I think we can agree on that. But lenders spend a lot of time <laughs> trying to increase their pull through and not have people shop around. And um, so how do you like, how do you conquer that? Like what's probably right for the consumer and what's better for the mortgage lender that don't necessarily meet in the middle. And uh, yeah. How do you That's, think about that? Yeah. It's a, it's a great question. The, the way I think about it is, you know, if the consumer uses own up to shop for mortgage and, you know, get sort of the deal that they think is sort of best for them, that's an offer that the lenders presented and ultimately the offer that the lenders decided they're going to offer and, and own up to, uh, no, no, no pun intended. Oh, own up. <laughs> so, yeah, I like good. how you worked. <laughs> um, so, the, you know, the advantage of, of our platform is they were able to pipe the lender's actual best execution pricing, you know, all of their fees. You can think about it almost like getting a mini loan estimate as part of own yeah. up. And so once the consumer actually gets over to the lender, you know, there's very little hey, I have to do all this stuff to keep the consumer, the consumer still shopping. Sure, that occurs. People are, um, I think by nature now, exposed to advertising and someone knows, hey, you're interested in a mortgage, then Facebook knows, okay, I'm going to present you all these other um, mortgage offers. But in this sort of dynamic, when the consumer gets to one of our lenders, they are prepared to move forward with that lender and ultimately feel like they've done a really good job shopping. I mean, the data I'd cite for you is... Um, all of our offers that come through our concierge platform are in the top 50%. And typically a consumer uh, will get at least one offer that's in the 90th um, percentile. So, you know, you've automatically reduced a lot of the um, the propensity to, to sub-optimize. And then when a consumer feels like, hey, I'm getting a really good deal here, they're less likely to go and sort of say, okay, well, what's under this rock? Uh, by the way, you know, 94% of our traffic is purchased. And on a purchase, at least you've got sort of a, a fixed timeline where, hey, I've got to close this thing in 30 days. There's only so long you can shop before you got to, you know, make commitment and, and go forward. So does a does a lender need a, a consumer direct arm or a special desk to handle like leads from own up? Because it doesn't sound like it's a lead you want to pass to a retail originator who's going to have a, you know, maybe a, a comp model that doesn't match the ability to give the, the pricing that we're talking about here. Yeah. We've seen a couple different um, flavors, all that can work. So you've got, I'd say your classic um, retail model, but as I said earlier, they're interested in consumer direct. They're willing to, you know, have a lower margin channel. They might route them to a, a, a subset of those retail loan officers. Sometimes people use junior LOs or they might use a license processor or something like that. Um, folks that, they know that, hey, this is an own up lead. It's coming through a different channel. The comp's not going to be 75, 80 basis points because you actually don't have to do you know, all that work on it, right? You're just basically taking someone that's already shopped and committed to you as a lender. You just got to process and underwrite it and, and take it to closing. So um, that, that's sort of the, I'd say a lender that leads more retail, but trying to do consumer direct. Um, and then it works really well for the existing consumer direct folks who already you know are list, used to the lower margin. They've got, you know, used to be armies, probably smaller armies of, of people there that are ready to sort of field these um, leads. I think the cop models there tend to be more salary plus, you know, some commission versus a hundred percent salary. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, done correctly, it, it can really succeed in, in both. And, you know, I, I would say um, we like partnering with both as long as your pricing is good and, you, you know, you have a commitment to excellence and, you know, taking good care of the customers, we're, we're pretty much indifferent. I know a lot of lenders have developed different 
uh, like compensation buckets for for bar for for lead sources. So something that's like self sourced goes in a a certain pricing bucket, but something that is a, a company provided lead might be priced differently. Is that where like a lender might figure out like how they route the route a own up lead internally and just ensure that it you know the, the LO might not get paid as much, but they also got like handed a purchase a buyer on a silver platter. Yeah, that, that's the exact analog. It's either, you know, you've, you've got an existing compensation plan that already sort of fits this, or some lenders will say, I have compensation plan, plans that vary based on the channel that that lead comes through. And as long as that lead comes through the channel, you can compliantly, you know, pay that uh, different compensation. So yeah, I think that's good. So w- when you launched the business in 2016, and then and kind of fast forward to today, we were you and are you competing with with any other lead gen providers or aggregators that 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 are running this level of concierge playbook? Like, what is the what does the competitive landscape look like for you? Yeah, I think if, if you asked us when we started, I would say we competed with any lender, um, any place you could get a mortgage, any loan officer, you know, in America. I think over time um, we've come to sort of see you know lead generated as competition as well, but. You know, if you think about even our own lender network, um, we have 50% of the top 20 lenders that participate on the platform. They're all trying to grow their businesses. But what's amazing is they're also very like cooperative. I had a lender, one lender talk to another one on sort of best practices for once the loan's been kind of booked um, on their system and how do you make sure the consumer stays engaged and what are sort of the right cadences and, and following up. So, you know, ultimately, um, Sure, we're competing uh, with, with any place you can sort of secure a, a mortgage, but we're, we're dealing with a massive market here, and you know our focus has always been internal. How do you get your own um, business right and sort of succeed? And then you know the competition is another thing you can't really uh, you can't really control. Yeah, so uh, kind of outside of competition, like how has the overall lead gen marketplace? changed? And we can probably just talk about the fa- past couple of years since the market has changed so much in the last. 24 to 36 months. Yeah, I think um, a few things are sort of note, noteworthy. Um, one is sort of last February, sort of CFPB's ruling on mortgage marketplace. It's not, not a ruling, just sort of an opinion reminding folks that, hey, certain practices just, you know, aren't things that we're going to tolerate, you know, steering and sending, you know, traffic to those that are paying, you know, the highest fee, doing stuff in a sort of not neutral manner. You know, our business was always, always set up to um, align with what the consumer's best interests were, so we never sort of experienced that. Um, I think the biggest shift, you know, market, uh, and this is largely due to the rates, is the adaptation from going to from from like a, a refi market to a purchase market. We, we used to hear all these anecdotes from some of the like the lead gen OGs that you know I, I would basically give purchase leads away if you bought so many refi leads, right? Now, no one's got sort of refied traffic. It's all purchase traffic. And a lot of the lenders who, you know, I think you could lump the consumer direct group historically would focus on refis because they're quick payback and you're, you're, you're competing, you know, largely based on rate. Um, but they've had to adapt to become, you know, real uh, purchase, purchase focus. And the ones we've um, seen succeeding are the ones that have made that and realized that you can't evaluate a cohort of leads after you know two weeks. Some of these leads, especially in this market where the purchases are taking longer due to the inventory and the affordability issue, sometimes a lead that comes in today may not you know mature to a, a lock loan or a funded transaction for you know three, six, 12, um, 12 months. So I think that's been another important dynamic in seeing how quickly uh, both lead generators and and lenders have had to respond to that, especially ones that just historically weren't built around purchase. They were built around, I'm going to sell rate on a refi. How do you, do, do you think that this NAR commissions lawsuit and settlement that we saw break last week, do you think that that changes the lead gen market at all for purchase? Or we have any like impacts on consumer behavior or LO, LO realtor partnership? Like, how do you see that playing into the, as, as we look forward in the lead gen world? Yeah, it's a it's an awesome question. I I think um, we'll find out 
in, by July in terms of how some of these things. But will we? Yeah, I don't, I don't I mean, know. Maybe we're already you... acting like today. Like, I mean, like there's there's brokers that are making decisions, changing business models. Like consumers are already like you know raising the flag and asking for different commission structures. Even if this isn't approved by the July date, like the markets like adapting adapting yeah yeah i think a, a couple things i mean you know you can read all the sort of mainstream media on it and it feels like the sky's falling and sort of massive disruption is on its way and you can also read counterpoints to that which suggests like hey in some small markets where this has sort of been the norm there hasn't been you know much of a change i, I candidly don't know you know who, who to believe um ultimately from a lead generator's perspective you know, we see a lot of people coming to own up before they get to a real estate agent anyway. And what, what we're sort of seeing there is people want to figure out how much they can afford. And in some cases, agents want to know that, you know, consumers sort of well vetted before they go and show them any properties, especially in a model where, hey, maybe I'm not getting two and a half, three percent of the, you know, total commission now. Maybe I'm uh, getting some smaller fixed fee, like I got to really prioritize how I spend um, how I spend my time. So, um, I would say today probably seventy percent of the people that come to us are coming to us without an agent. So, you know, on the earlier stages of the buyer journey, um, and you know, most of the rest of them are coming to us with a you know an accepted offer. So they're already like attached to you know a, a real estate um, a real estate agent. So, yeah, we'll see. I, I you 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 probably know better than me. I'd be interested in your take. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing, we're hearing like similar majority metrics on the number of purchase borrowers that are coming to LOs before they talk to an agent. We we know that like the, the order of operations and home search has changed. Like people are, are searching for their homes without before talking to agents in many cases, sometimes for, for years. And now that financing is so expensive, they know they need to talk to a mortgage lender to understand their what they can afford so like like we've definitely seen that order of operations shift um man i listened to a podcast this morning um from a big national publication talking about the uh you know mainstream publication talking about the lawsuits and like i just i turned it off like infuriated and just just straight infuriated turned on rage against the machine and came to office came to the office like ready to like all right we're driving change today because I, i just think the um like this settlement's being weaponized against the agent and um, the, the the podcast and then and also like the plaintiff's attorney, you know, has talked about this David versus Goliath thing and like, you know, positions the consumer as as David and NAR as the Goliath. But they forget that NAR is a million agents that are David, too. And uh, I just like I was so infuriated, but like. Anger doesn't get you anywhere. So like, I've just been thinking more and more about like, how does the LO and agent community have to operate? I love how you phrased it. Like agents might just have to get really specific with how they use their time and like prioritize who they spend time with and when, if, if there is that much pressure on commissions. But, um, I, I I don't have a, you know, crystal ball like any of us do, but like, I, I, I know that agents and brokerages have been dealt their share of blows over the decades and they evolve. And ultimately the consumer has indicated that they still value advice. And, um, I, I know there's a, a positive rosy future for the profession, but this, um, this period we're going through right now is, uh, it's kind of dark. Yeah. I think there's a lot, a lot of similarities, um, from when sort of Dodd-Frank was, uh, you know, the sky's falling for loan officers. So everyone's like, oh, yeah. well, you know, we, we, we just aren't going to be able to have a, a business and we're not going to have enough loan officers. Everyone's going to leave the business. I, I think people will um, ultimately pay for good service. And, you know, maybe you use some part, lose some part-timers. Like we lost part-time LOs because it just didn't make sense anymore. Maybe you lose some people that, you know, just aren't um, really that good. But the good ones find a way to do it. You know, like people value... Uh, consumer uh, value professionals that you know do well by them, and I think those are, those folks are going to be totally fine. Yeah, could couldn't agree more, Mike. I can't thank you enough for joining me for this conversation today. R- really cool to hear about your mortgage and entrepreneurial journey. Learn more about own up, and also tie it together with some market dynamics. That I think um, we're all trying to muscle through with with bringing clarity through the chaos right now, and I, you helped with that. Cool. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it, and uh, look forward to talking again soon. Yeah.